good evening. On behalf of the faculty and staff at the Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John. I am the Master Curator at the von Junst Library's Corvallis branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 12 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the 1912 documentary of Mr. Burroughs' uncle John Carter of Mars. But first, I have a brief appeal to make. We at the Von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds are about to launch a historic fundraising campaign to finance the addition of our Randolph Carter Memorial Dreaming Room. We have already received a sizable donation toward this project from an anonymous donor who identifies himself only as, quote, Mr. Theodore Ward of Providence, Rhode Island, in exchange for which we have agreed to rename the library's reading room after Mr. Ward's son. A full announcement of this will be made following the fundraising campaign. For now, however, the important thing is that Mr. Ward's pledge is a matching grant. He has pledged to match every donation made up to 10,000 Köln marks all the way up through the start of Pledge Week. In other words, listeners, Mr. Ward has made a Thonbuster pledge. Now, before I continue, I must, with some embarrassment, apologize and make a correction. In last night's broadcast, I confused the Köln mark with the Deutsch mark, with which I am more familiar. The Deutsch mark trades at roughly 50 cents on the American dollar. The Köln mark, however, trades at one mark per eight ounces of gold bullion. I apologize for any confusion, and I do hope this minor difference in currency value will not discourage anyone from making a generous contribution. Speaking of generous contributions, we do have some premiums, excuse me, I believe that's premia, of our own, to encourage you to loosen your purse strings and make a generous pledge today. For a pledge of just 3,000 Köln marks, that's a mere 24,000 ounces of gold, we will send you, by registered mail, one of the salvaged bricks from the demolished library building the building within the stream of time which was demolished by the gray mass of angry chaos loosed by the small boy Euston many years ago. We are able to offer these priceless pieces because luckily I went back to the site the next day and scavenged up some of the bricks as souvenirs. Er, er, excuse me, I'm sorry, the small boy Euston did this. For a pledge of 6,000 Köln marks, we are offering two bricks with a shard of window glass from the demolished library. For a pledge of 25,000 Köln marks, you will receive a vial of the ashes that were left after the whole Nigral was destroyed by the rays of the rising sun on the first day after the library was snatched from the grasping hands of time. The prefects carefully gathered the accursed black dust and the taloned finger bone the following morning, knowing the day would come when it would be needed. That day is upon us, and if you act now, you can reap the benefit. That is, if you happen to have six tons of gold bullion to contribute to our project. Finally, for a donation of a mere 50,000 Köln marks, we are offering one of the seven black candles used in the ritual of repayment of Sir John Grimlin on March 10, 1930. But if you wish to take advantage of this opportunity, you had better hurry. Supplies are limited. We had planned to offer the taloned finger bone mysteriously left behind in the aftermath of the Chor Nigral for a pledge of 100,000 Köln marks. However, while such preparations were being made, the Council of Prefects found that my predecessor, Lector Gustav von Meithaus, had absconded with it to a vault below the great stone tower and was chanting some sort of incantation over it. After firmly but lovingly reprimanding the good Lector, the Council of Prefects determined that the finger bone was too metaphysically potent to allow it to leave the library grounds. 
The problem subsequently solved itself, however, as the finger bone disappeared shortly thereafter, and the council claims not to know what happened to it. Oddly enough, that was just before Lector von Meithaus's sudden resignation and disappearance, just before midsummer of this very year. So, alas, the taloned finger bone is not available. But for the same size pledge, you can get two of the seven black candles. Why not pick up the phone and call in a generous pledge today? While you're rummaging around looking for the key to your secret cellar vault where you keep your gold bullion and reserves of Amontillado, perhaps we should turn to today's reading. Today we will read Chapter 12 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Let us begin. Chapter 12 A Prisoner with Power as I entered and saluted, Lorquas Ptomo signaled me to advance, and fixing his great hideous eyes upon me, addressed me thus. You have been with us a few days, yet during that time you have, by your prowess, won a high position among us. Be that as it may, you are not one of us. You owe us no allegiance. Your position is a peculiar one, he continued. You are a prisoner, and yet you give commands which must be obeyed. You are an alien, and yet you are a Tharkian chieftain. You are a midget, and yet you can kill a mighty warrior with one blow of your fist. And now you are reported to have been plotting to escape with another prisoner of another race, a prisoner who from her own admission half believes you are returned from the Valley of Dor. Either one of these accusations, if proved, would be sufficient grounds for your execution, but we are a just people, and you shall have a trial on our return to Thark if Tal Hajus so commands. But, he continued in his fierce guttural tones, if you run off with the red girl, it is I who shall have to account to Tal Hajus. It is I who shall have to face Tars Tarkas and either demonstrate my right to command, or the metal from my dead carcass will go to a better man, for such is the custom of the Tharks. I have no quarrel with Tars Tarkas. Together we rule supreme, the greatest of the lesser communities among the green men. We do not wish to fight among ourselves, and so if you were dead, John Carter, I should be glad. Under two conditions only, however, may you be killed by us without orders from Talhajus, in personal combat and self-defense should you attack one of us, or were you apprehended in an attempt to escape. As a matter of justice, I must warn you that we only await one of these two excuses for ridding ourselves of so great a responsibility. The safe delivery of the Red Girl to Tal Hajus is of the greatest importance. Not in a thousand years have the Tharks made such a capture. She is the granddaughter of the greatest of the Red Jeddaks, who is also our bitterest enemy. I have spoken. The Red Girl told us that we were without the softer sentiments of humanity, but we are a just and truthful race. You may go. Turning, I left the audience chamber. So this was the beginning of Sarkocha's persecution. I knew that none other could be responsible for this report which had reached the ears of Lord Quespitomo so quickly, and now I recalled those portions of our conversation which had touched upon escape and upon my origin. Sarkocha was at the time Tars Tarkas' oldest and most trusted female. As such, she was a mighty power behind the throne, for no warrior had the confidence of Lord Quespitomo to such an extent as did his ablest lieutenant, Tars Tarkas. However, instead of putting thoughts of possible escape from my mind, my audience with Lorquas Potomo only served to center my every faculty on this subject. Now, more than before, the absolute necessity for escape, insofar as Dejah Thoris was concerned, was impressed upon me, for I was convinced that some horrible fate awaited her at the headquarters of Tal Hajis. As described by Sola, this monster was the exaggerated personification of all the ages of cruelty, ferocity, and brutality from which he had descended. Cold, cunning, calculating, he was also, in marked contrast to most of his fellows, a slave to that brute passion which the waning demands for procreation upon their dying planet has almost stilled in the Martian breast. The thought that the divine Dejah Thoris might fall into the clutches of such an abysmal atavism started the cold sweat upon me. Far better that we save friendly bullets for ourselves at the last moment, as did those brave frontier women of my lost land, who took their own lives rather than fall into the hands of the Indian braves. As I wandered about the plaza lost in my gloomy forebodings, Tars Tarkas approached me on his way from the audience chamber. His demeanor toward me was unchanged, and he greeted me as though we had not just parted a few moments before. 
Where are your quarters, John Carter? he asked. I have selected none, I replied. It seemed best that I quartered myself either by myself or among the other warriors, and I was awaiting an opportunity to ask your advice. As you know, and I smiled, I am not yet familiar with all the customs of the Tharks. Come with me, he directed, and together we moved off across the plaza to a building which I was glad to see adjoined that occupied by Sola and her charges. My quarters are on the first floor of this building, he said and the second floor is fully occupied also by warriors, but the third floor and the floors above are vacant. You may take your choice of these. I understand, he continued, that you have given up your woman to the Red Prisoner. Well, as you have said, your ways are not our ways, but you can fight well enough to do about as you please, and so if you wish to give your woman to a captive, it is your own affair. But as a chieftain, you should have those to serve you, and in accordance from our customs, you may select any or all of the females from the retinues of the chieftains whose medal you now wear. I thanked him, but assured him that I could get along very nicely without assistance, except in the manner of preparing food. And so he promised to send women to me for this purpose, and also for the care of my arms and the manufacture of my ammunition, which he said would also be necessary. I suggested that they might also bring some of the sleeping silks and furs which belonged to me as spoils of combat, for the nights were cold and I had none of my own. He promised to do so and departed. Left alone, I ascended the winding corridor to the upper floors in search of suitable quarters. The beauties of the other buildings were repeated in this, and as usual I was soon lost in a tour of investigation and discovery. I finally chose a front room on the third floor, because this brought me nearer to Deja Thoris, whose apartment was on the second floor of the adjoining building, and it flashed upon me that I could rig up some means of communication whereby she might signal me in case she needed either my services or my protection. Adjoining my sleeping apartment were baths, dressing rooms, and other sleeping and living apartments, all in some ten rooms on this floor. The windows at the back rooms overlooked an enormous court which formed the center of the square made by the buildings which faced the four contiguous streets, which was now given over to the quartering of various animals belonging to the warriors occupying the adjoining buildings. While the court was entirely overgrown with the yellow moss-like vegetation which blankets practically the entire surface of Mars, yet numerous fountains, statuary benches, and pergola-like contraptions bore witness to the beauty which the court must have presented in bygone times, when graced by the fair-haired laughing people whom stern and unalterable cosmic laws had driven not only from their homes but from all except the vaguest legends of their descendants. One could easily picture the gorgeous foliage of the luxuriant Martian vegetation which once filled this scene with life and color, the graceful figures of the beautiful women, the straight and handsome men, the happy frolicking children, the sunlight, happiness, peace. It was difficult to realize that they had gone, down through the ages of darkness, cruelty, and ignorance, until their hereditary instincts of culture and humanitarianism had risen ascendant once more in the final composite race, which is now dominant upon Mars. My thoughts were cut short by the advent of several young females, bringing loads of weapons, silks, furs, jewels, cooking utensils, and casks of food and drink, including considerable loot from the aircraft. All this, it seemed, had been the property of the two chieftains I had slain, and now, by the customs of the Tharks, it had become mine. At my direction they placed the stuff in one of the back rooms, and then departed only to return with a second load, which they advised me constituted the balance of my goods. On the second trip they were accompanied by ten or fifteen other women and youths, who it seemed formed the retinues of the two chieftains. They were not their families, nor their wives, nor their servants. The relationship was peculiar, and so unlike anything known to us that it is most difficult to describe. All property among the Green Martians is owned in common by the community except the personal weapons, ornaments, and sleeping silks and furs of the individuals. These alone can one claim undisputed right to, nor can he accumulate more of these than are required for his actual needs. The surplus he holds merely as a custodian, and it is passed on to the younger members of the community as necessity demands. The women and children of a man's retinue may be likened to a military unit, for which he is responsible in various ways, as in matters of instruction, discipline, sustenance, and the exigencies of their continual roamings and their unending strife with the other communities and with the Red Martians. His women are in no sense wives. The Green Martians use no word corresponding in meaning with this earthly word. Their mating is a matter of community interest solely, and is directed without reference to natural selection. 
The council of chieftains of each community control the matter as surely as the owner of a Kentucky racing stud directs the scientific breeding of his stock for the improvement of the whole. In theory it may sound well, as is often the case with theories, but the results of ages of this unnatural practice, coupled with the community interest in the offspring being held paramount to that of the mother, is shown in the cold, cruel creatures and their gloomy, loveless, mirthless existence. It is true that the green Martians are absolutely virtuous, both men and women, with the exception of such degenerates as Tal Hodges. But better far a finer balance of human characteristics, even at the expense of a slight and occasional loss of chastity. Finding that I must assume responsibility for these creatures, whether I would or not, I made the best of it and directed them to find quarters on the upper floors, leaving the third floor to me. One of the girls I charged with the duties of my simple cuisine, and directed the others to take up the various activities which had formerly constituted their vocations. Thereafter I saw little of them, nor did I care to. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, with branches in Dusseldorf, Stregoikavar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org, or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear, moonless night. Rent or purchase a small skiff, and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Use the ancient stone stairs that rise up from the deepest and most Stygian depths of the Rhine unless you feel them vibrating as if under the tramping of a thousand marching feet, in which case we do recommend that you reschedule your visit. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you lucrative